Did everybody grab an evaluation? Did you sign in? Could you come sign, sign in and grab an evaluation? Did you get one? Perfect. And then we will just go ahead and get started. you talk for the year so we have had an excellent series and I'm very excited to hear about this talk today because it's different from the other talks but I think it's been really really interesting okay so this is Dr. David Jung yeah yes I'm trying really hard um, and he is going to talk to us today about designing obstacle avoiding schools for the visually impaired using modern technology okay uh, good afternoon everyone um, first I'll talk about the problem according to the World Health Organization, uh, in the world there's about 285 million visual impaired people, of which 39 million are blind. This means that someone in the world goes to blind in about every 5 seconds, and uh, almost 90% uh, of the visual impaired population live in, in uh, low-income settings. And there, this is the map of global prevalence of blindness, and the different color represents the different percentage. And the lighter green means smaller percentage, but the dark green or yellow or red represents the higher percentage of the uh, widow in part of the population. Um, you can see that most of the blind people live in the developing countries, and the public facilities in the developing countries are not well established as they are in the developed countries, such as in the US. So this makes their, their life even uh, harder. And the uh, visually impaired population in the U.S. here is takes about one percentage. It's, uh, so we have uh, about 3.4 million visually impaired people in the U.S., of which 1.3 million uh, is uh, legally blind. Um, since the leading cause to the uh, visual loss are age-related diseases, such as glaucoma or diabetes, and the world population is become aging, and so there will be more uh, visually impaired people or blind people in the coming decades. According to the report by National Eye Institute, it suggests out that with the youngest of the baby boomers, 1865, by 2029, the number of people with visual impairment or blindness in the United States is expected to double to more than 8 million by um, 2015. So this number uh, shows up that there's a dire need for the researchers to do something. That they need to expect to invent new technologies or develop new devices to help the blind people to, uh, to travel, to make their life easier and safer and more uh, independent. Uh, unfortunately, in the last uh, 19 years, the post standard mobility tool for the blind people has been the white can, also known as the uh, long can. Uh, although it is uh, affordable due to its short range detectability, the user had to walk into the next building in order to find the doorway, locate the past, or detect objects. Uh, another visual get, um, aid are the guide dogs. Uh, however, only 2% of the visual impaired community has a trained guide dog for daily assistance. Although the guide dogs are wonderful companions and they are superior to the Viking in many aspects. Uh, there's a huge cost uh, to train a guide dog. It costs about $50,000. And also the user needs to take care of the dog and feed it in its service time. And the average service time of a guide dog is only about six years. So um, to summarize, uh, the traditional navigational uh, navigation aids for the blind people are either functionally ineffective or uh, requires heavy heavy training cost or extra <coughs> care. As nowadays, the technology has been uh, rapidly improvement and the industry of small uh, scale sensors has been appeared in many different applications. And these sensors have enabled the multifunctionalities of the, from the small smart devices such as iPhone, iPad, iWatch, to the sophisticated system as well as the uh, unmanned autonomous vehicle of the many good service robots. And these technologies and uh, uh, devices have made our lives uh, convenient and colorful. Uh, but we should not forget that there is a small group of people who desperately need these technologies. 
even to satisfy their basic life needs. So by transferring the technologies from robotics to the human beings, and the, the designed electronic travel as are expected to have two functionalities. The first is the obstacle detection, and the second is environmental mapping and navigation. So the basic function of uh, electronic travel ad is to transform the signals received by the small sensors into other form of signals that are recognizable by the brand users, such as the uh, audio feedback or the tactile cues. So in this presentation, I will uh, introduce the progress of the ETA developments in three parts. The first part, I will talk about some existing ETA devices. I will talk about their functions, technologies, and limitations. Uh, in the second part, uh, I will go through some um, uh, advanced 3D cameras, and also uh, present some ongoing research projects based on these 3D cameras. Hopefully, they can give us some picture about what's going on in this field, what the peer researchers are doing in this field, they are, what, uh, what effort they are doing to uh, make the blind people life easier. And in the final part, I will share some experiences, uh, both from researchers and the customers' perspective. Hopefully, this whole thing can give uh, you a, a kind of sense that if you in the future get involved in this field, uh, you know how to start your research and uh, follow which direction you can make significant uh, contribution. The previous uh, electronic travel ads are working like a radar. So most of them use the ultrasound. They send out uh, acoustic waves that in the frequency domain that's beyond the human hearing ability and receive the signal bounced back by the object. And uh, most of this type of, uh, of um, Devices are called Go or No Go device. It's working a very simple principle. You either detect objects or detect obstacle, no go. Otherwise, you can go free. So it's just very simple. I uh, list some uh, major products in this slide. The first one is called the uh, Mini Guide. It's kind of a smaller uh, handler. You have some button there. You press the button to send out acoustic waves. If you detect obstacle, then we will bother it and tell you, okay, there is something in that direction. It can detect the obstacles within eight meters. And the next one is ultra ultra can. It integrates this function into the white can to so combine this function together. So there's a, a button there's a button in the handler, just press the button to send out a cone shape of the QZ wave. It can detect the obstacle the size like the body size. This size uh, object. It has two working modes. One is for detect the obstacle in four meters, the other is for one meters, the two working modes. But this device also has some limitation. It has false readings in the uh, heavy snow condition or heavy rain conditions is not that reliable. But this this one is called the, the laser scan. Uh, so uh, it's working the similar principle I like the radar, but instead of using the acoustic wave, it sends out the laser beams. The laser beam is more reliable than the acoustic waves, uh, but it's more expensive. Uh, you can see that in that one is about two thousand six hundred dollars, and it sends three uh, beams: one is straight, uh, three forward, one is upward, one is downward to protect the obstacles uh, in different area. Thank you. And the fourth one is called wheelchair pathfinder. Uh, its working principle is similar to the laser pen, but it's integrated in a wheelchair so the user can sit on the wheelchair and detect objects by sending out the beams in different directions. Uh, the final one uh, is called guide cam. It has an array of ultrasound uh, sender. So from in this way, it can detect the obstacle in different uh, directions. And then it will uh, estimate uh, uh, trajectory and control these two wheels to help the user to avoid that obstacle. Um, but this design is a uh, robotic center design. So the, the center is on uh, the robotic, it's not on the user. So the user experience is not that good. So there are three main drawbacks of this go or no go system. The first one is that due to the nature of the acoustic waves, it cannot um, detect the shape of the object. 
It can only tell you there's an object or not, but it cannot detect the shape and the texture and the more detailed information. So, um, and also you cannot detect the motion information of the object, whether it's dynamic, whether it's moving or something, some, that information cannot be obtained. Uh, also, second, it has limited range, and its a slow response may not be suitable for faster workers. And the third one is that if it is optically waved, it will interfere with the normal sound. So in this way, it may create some screening effects that can impair the user's hearing ability. So uh, motiv motivated by these drawbacks, the researchers has tried to um, refer to the other technology using the other sensors, like the cameras, especially uh, 3D cameras. There are different types of 3D cameras, and this one is called Switch Ranger 4000. And this is a time of flight camera. It has an array of the, the laser and send out the array of lasers and receive the uh, bounced back signals. And it, gen it can generate two types of image. One is intensity image, one is a range image. The intensity image just have the information about the texture of objects. So it has a different gray scale to show in the the texture of the uh, object and the depth data, the depth image uh, have the distance uh, information about uh, how distance of the object towards to the user. If you buy, combine these two image, these two type of data together, you can generate a three D point cloud data and to show in the dense information about the surrounding uh, environment. But um, because it uses uh, every of the lasers, it is much expensive. Uh, it costs about more than four thousand dollars, and also it has um, a narrow field of view. It can only see a small uh, area, and it has uh, limited uh, resolution. So it only has one hundred and seventy-six uh, times one hundred and forty-four pixels for this image. The other type is called projected light three D camera, and uh, what it does is uh, has a laser beam. The, project the structure lights to the environment and using a technology called stereo triangulation to compute the depth for each pixel. It has a large family of cameras like the Kinect Action and Prime Sense that, uh, that all fall into this category. And uh, this type of, of, of camera can produce very dense and high resolution um, depth data, at least uh, 640 times uh, 480 pixels, and also it can detect the objects within this range, 0.6 to 5 meters. And the best thing is that it's cheap, it's only about $200, so that's the reason it appears in various different researchers. Uh, the drawback of this type of camera is that it's because it uses a um, laser projector, it may consume large power, so it's, for, for example, Kinect is 12 voltage input. So it is not very friendly to small device developments. So later, the Intel has made some improvements that have uh, this type of it's called R200 camera. You can see it is very small and light. Its size is comparable to a quarter, this small size. And also it can produce very high dense depth and image data, like at least 640 times 480. And later they have also produced this called uh, Intel D series camera. And for this one, D435, it, it is designed for longer object detection. It can detect objects uh, even up at 8 to 10 meters that far. And this one is my favorite. It is uh, the new coming, I think it's this year come out. It's, a, it's an Apple structure called uh, 3D camera. And it's working in a similar way, but it can generate a very reliable and accurate depth data, even in high dynamic scenarios. You can see here, this is the, the fan, it's rotating at 1000 RPM uh, that fast, but the left image is the output of the depth data. This is very reliable and very accurate. Uh, actually, I have the camera, the Apple Struggle here. So if you are interested about the outcomes and want to see more um, detail of the image, you can uh, come to me, I can show you the demo after the presentation. So we have, nowadays we have this, all these fancy, cool 3D cameras, but the following question is that what can we use these uh, sensors to improve 
the electronic travel ads to improve the <coughs> device in order to help the blind people for their travel task. Next, I will uh, introduce some um, projects related to these cameras. Uh, first one is called uh, SmartCam. Actually, this is the, my PhD work. And I, I developed it in the University of Arkansas, Little Rock. It uh, use a Switch Ranger 4000 camera and install it on the Viking. You can see there's a battery and there's a tablet to re retrieve the data from the camera and send it back to the laptop computer through the Wi Fi. And all the algorithms running in the uh, backend laptop, like the post estimation to localize the user in the indoor environment, and the path finding to design a path to guide the user to achieve a, their destination. And the navigation command will send back to the user and the broadcast through the Bluetooth headset to tell them how to go, how to move forward in the next step. Um, here is a short video to show how it works. So this is the basic principle how it works. And uh, uh, I have done some um, human subject tests. I recruited some um, friend, people and invited them to our lab and uh, let them to try this device and to work for a while and ask them how do you like it. And I, I asked them what you can. And they all complained to me that it's bulky. And <laughs> especially the SR4000 camera is made by metal, so it's very heavy. And also the battery is heavy. If they swing it for about 10 or 20 minutes, their weight will become very soft. I say, I like the navigation, I like the command, but I do not, I'm like doing the exercise while you are doing this. So I complained it's bulky. I say, okay, no problem, it's just a prototype, and we will work on that. So it is bulky, not very user friendly, and also it needs Wi Fi dependent. In some area where there's no Wi Fi, this may not work. So it's a lot of room to improve. And this device is called uh, Robot Vision Kit, it's developed by the people from the USC. Uh, it uses an uh, RGB camera and uh, install the camera on the top of the head of the user and ask them to wear a vest. They install some vibrator motors too on the shoulder to on the west, and to then run some algorithms, uh, some localization and obstacle detection algorithms. For example, this is the image, and this is the traversable map. The red bar represents the obstacles, and the green area represents the traversable area, like the flaws. So in this way, they can tell the user which direction they need to go. If the user is approaching to some obstacles, the vibrator will vibrate to signal the user, okay, you may bump into something or something like that. But the, the drawback is also is it's bulky. It's not only you wear a, a, a camera on the top of the head, it seems a little bit weird. And also you need to wear an actual vest to do that. And also not user friendly. Uh, this one is called the Kinect Cam. Uh, it looks like that the, in the back there's a computer here to do the computation. And the uh, install the tie the Kinect on the Viking, and the the, uh, the idea of this project is that it uh, model the three D space in front of user as uh, a, a three degree of freedom area of cubes, and the status of each cubes is labeled as either empty or occupied. In this way, they can uh, describe the boundary of the obstacles, about the size and the boundaries, and in this they can. Therefore, provide the more accurate travel uh, direction to the user to help them to avoid the obstacles. Um, but the best thing is that it works like a stop scan go motion. So it works like a, you need to hold the scan here, hold the cane here, and scan the environment, and then find which way you need to go and to move next, and then scan next. So it's not very smooth for normal working. And, uh, it is only focused on the obstacle detection. There's no uh, path planning and all the other functions integrated in this system. 
And this one is called uh, Real Sense Glass. It's developed by the people from the Zhejiang University. It used this smaller uh, camera, and uh, uh, this is IMU that they built a print, a 3D print of frame to hold all these uh, small devices. And this camera is connected to a, a surface tablet, and the surface tablet doing the computation and set and they use the Bluetooth connection to the headphone to provide the audio feedback. So you put the device on, it looks like uh, this way. It's not that bulky, but uh, you also need to hold the surface tablet in order to uh, move forward. And its key idea is not to, it's not try to detect the obstacles like here the car, but instead it only detects the floor, the road. For example here, it, it tries to extract uh, the area of, of the, about the road, and the green color area is the travel score area. And then it uses the different sounds to uh, notify the user which direction is free to go. It's uh, obstacle free direction. But if you watch this uh, finger in Matthew, interest that they use different uh, sounds like uh, the violin represents one clock direction and the piano rep represents 11 clock direction. But in fact, it's uh, it's not that user friendly because the blind people need to be trained to know which sound represents which direction, and this actually act, um, bring them more extra burden to to use this device. So they need to train them uh, for about at least one hour to help them to know uh, these five direction corresponding to these five sounds. Um, this is the uh, robot, and this is uh, last year our lab's work, and uh, we have at uh, more sensors on the white hand, like the RealSense D35 uh, um, camera and IMU, and also we use uh, Upboard, so we do not need to uh, backend the computer to, to do the computation. All the computation uh, focused on here. It is uh, a pretty car sized small computer. It's very easy to be uh, put portable on the, on, the, on the location. And also, we uh, designed some, uh, a device called the Active Rolling Table. It's showing here. Uh, what, should, what is that? The motivation is that sometimes if you, I, I ask you to, for example, turn your head left about 30 degrees, you know how to do that. And turn right about 50 degrees, you know how to do that. But for the blind user, they have no sense about how much is 30 degrees, how much is 50 degrees. So sometimes we give them, like, uh, you need to turn left 40 degree. They have no idea what's going on. But this device can automatically point to the that, that direction that you want them to go. So so it's it's very useful in the actual traveling task for the brand users. And also we use from plan map to do the localization to improve the accuracy. And so there's still some some parts can be improved. We are working on to make it even more sim simpler. Maybe we can just implement all these functions using just a smartphone. So now to use the extra sensor, we can use integrate them into a smartphone. Maybe into one app to do all these things. But working on that, and also this device do not have recovery functionality. What I mean recovery is that if the device is shut down or the batteries go dead, and it cannot recover by itself, it has to. Uh, user involved. The user has to tell the system where I am. Maybe I'm just outside, uh, get out from the elevator and I'm enter the building from which uh, entrance. Um, currently, do not have this uh, function. And this one, Asana, it represents an intelligent situation awareness and navigation ad. <laughs> this is developed by uh, CCNY and they use the the device called Google Tango to do all the localization um, function, and also they uh, integrated with this function called um, indoor semantic map and ADF map alignment. You do not have to know what that means. I will uh, explain to you. It's very simple. Uh, when you saw this picture, when you saw this picture, do you know do you know where the photographer is, is at the location? Of course, this is in New York, right? Because it's the Liberty and a statue of the liberty. And when you saw this picture, if I asked you where the where the photographer is, you know it's in Washington DC. And if you saw this picture, 
you know, this is enrichment, right? It is uh, uh, Robert Lee Memorial. And why you know that? Because in your brain, you already have this database, you have this dictionary, you have uh, a social, it is a unique landmark to a unique location. This is already in your brain. So next time when you saw this picture, you just search that database, you know where you are. So this uh, indoor cementing map and ADF map alignments is actually doing the same thing. It's try to create a dictionary by associating some unique visual features or keywords with locations. Just like when you saw this finger, this is the image get from the camera, and it use some computer vision algorithm to extract some key features. We can call it the bag of words, some keywords, and they associated this key bag, these keywords, to a certain location in a 2D format. So the next time when you travel, re-enter into this scenario, it detects a similar uh, Keywords, it knows that, okay, the user is at this location, at label here. So in this way, it can have the recovery function. If it get lost, it, it goes into some previous uh, visited area, it can immediately know where, where they are. But this system also has some limitation. It has to pre-engineering engineering the environment. It has to um, use a camera to travel all the area and to build to extract the video words and to connect, to build a dictionary by associating the key features to a certain location manually. And then they can use this function. And also, it's not robust to illumination change. Uh, because it's used video feature, and if the, uh, the feature is taken in the daylight, or at, uh, in the night, the illumi is, it, it, it may not be matched because it uh, seems different. And also, it's not responsible to dynamic scenarios. And next one is the CDELI. This is developed by the cooperation between the University of Illinois State University with the Float uh, company. Uh, it also uses ta Google Tango device. It puts the device on a vest, asks the user to wear them, and the uh, Google Tango will connect to the headphone and tell them, warn them if they're approaching to some uh, obstacle. There is a video to show how it works. When you begin to create an app, the question is never really, what do you want to build? Or rather, what problem do you want to solve? My name is Cora, and I have no vision. My visual condition is not a starting arts. I have about half my vision left. Right now I have light perception. That is decreasing as I get older. I have Libra's congenital amaurosis, also known as LCA, which has caused me to be blind since birth. A lot of times it's really difficult to get somewhere when I need to just because I'm having to depend on other people, whether it's uh, friends, family, or public transportation. And traveling mainly is mobility is the main obstacle with not seeing. There's always something that wasn't there yesterday. I know I have limitations. I can only do so much without help. Introducing Sedalian. Sedalian brings the latest camera technology together with sophisticated software to detect the proximity and height of obstacles in your environment. That data is then translated into audio and haptic feedback to help you avoid it. If you had told me about this concept even over cocktails or something like that four or five, six years ago, I would have thought it's science fiction. But it isn't. I had a lot of fun with Sedalia. It was something to get used to because I've never used something like that before. But after I got acquainted with how the system worked, I felt like it was a lot easier and I feel like I walked with more confidence. You can identify objects in front of me before my can was to them. What kind of extends the range of my can by an extra four, five, ten feet? I don't want to have to struggle to see as I'm walking, or I don't want to have to worry about running into something today, and it will let you walk with ease and let you know, hey, you might run into something. I want to go see. Yeah, it's a lot. So um, it's just uh, um, very easy to use, and it's reliable to detect the obstacles, and it can provide very effective feedback to help the, the user to avoid obstacles.
it's very, I think it's very pretty good, but it also has some limitations because it's only focused on the obstacle avoidance. There's no localization information, no path, path uh, finding uh, functions. And also, you need to bear a, a vest with this uh, uh, device. Some, some, some of them may feel it's okay to, to wear that, but some of them may feel, hey, I do not want to wear some extra vest on my body. And also, at least the Tango may be a bottleneck because the Google has stopped the, this pro Tango project because it's not that profitable project. And uh, it's, this device has some overheating problem and because they use some extra sensor integrated in the back of this uh, uh, smartphone. So it's not very sell, it's not, sell not very good. So if you want to buy a Tango in the market, maybe not very easy to get. You can buy from eBay or somewhere else. So maybe Tango is the bottleneck to this type of project. And the next one is uh, Navicorp. And this is one of my favorites. It's developed by the researchers cooperation between the CMU and the IBM. And the, the usage is very easy. The user just needs to download the Navigate from Navicorp from the App Store and just use it like a GPS. You just enter the destination where you want to go. And then the app will constantly uh, give you audio feedback to guide you to walk to that direction, the, the destination. So you, you, you may hold a Viking and then hold a, a smartphone, and so you just follow the direction provided by the smartphone. And there is also a soft video. This was a really awesome experience for them. And, uh, but also this uh, project has some limitations. The, the major issue is that it needs to prior deploy the Bluetooth beacons in a certain area. So it's working the similar uh, principle like the, the, the map dictionary uh, technology. Uh, but instead of, using, instead of using the video features, it used the magnitude of the Bluetooth signals at the keywords to associate uh, this uh, magnitude to a certain location. So what it needs that it needs to deploy the a number of beacon uh, remitters in this area in order to cover all the signal area, and then use a uh, uh, iPhone or whatever to 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 collect the the magnitude of the Bluetooth and manually to associate each uh, magnitude to a certain location. So it, it also needs to pre-engineer the environment. 
So as far as, as I know, this um, system has been deployed only in certain areas like the CMU campus and the Pittsburgh Airport. So if you in the future get a chance to, to take out in the uh, Pittsburgh Airport, you may see some someone uh, holding a, uh, a, a iPhone or following some uh, audio feedback. You, you may not surprise what they are doing. And uh, also in certain uh, shopping malls or hotels, they have deployed this system. Um, this one is a smart suitcase. And uh, the motivation be uh, behind this project is that for certain places like the wild space area, it is uh, extremely challenging for the blind user because that there's too much sounding cues, too, mu too much dynamic objects around them. So that view is very hard to uh, navigate in wider space area, especially for the airports. So then the researchers may have the idea that, okay, if you, you travel in the airport, you may have the suitcase, so they just uh, uh, install a 3D camera here and a speaker here, just, just when, you, when, you, when you are walking, it detects the obstacle in front of you and uh, give you some feedback from the speaker to tell you, okay, you, uh, you may approach in to walking toward to the obstacle in front of you. It's, I think it's very cool, and there's a short demo for that. So it will have feedback different brownings uh, of based on the distance between the camera and the obstacle in front of you. At different uh, distance and they have different uh, level of warnings and until you uh, stop to a certain point. I really like this project because I cannot find any drawbacks for this uh, project. And I feel like when, when, when the, the user is uh, holding uh, this smart suitcase, when you see somebody standing in front of him, it's just working. And it's sort of like, I'm coming, get out from my way. So the others just uh, automatically uh, get away from, from that. So until now, I have introduced some the previous four of Novo systems and also the some ongoing projects from the left to the right, from this device to these devices, we can see some clear improvement from left to the right. The first improvement that we have, the, we can now have uh, obtain the whole picture of the surrounding objects. So we can get the shape of the objects. We can even further get some semantic information, like if we can run some object detection algorithm on this device, you can know, okay, maybe this is a chair, a table or some uh, person or something like that. And also we have get the whole status of these objects. We can nail the distance of that object to the user. And also the motion status, whether it's dynamic or still, or at which velocity is moving, follow which direction. And there's no range limit for color image. And it has a long range for depth data. And it can also have fast and multiple feedback and no without screening effect. We can see there is a lot of improve, improvement from the left to the right. Then the next following question is, is that what will be it look like in the next coming decade? What's the these techniques that can be involved in the next uh, coming 10 years? What we can learn from these projects? So here uh, I share some um, lessons, trends, and challenging opportunities from the uh, researchers' perspective, and what they have mistakes they have made, what kind of uh, some lessons we have need to avoid in the future. The first thing is that uh, we need to translate from the system-centered design to the user-centered design. Uh, it's kind of a kind of a trend that the developers or researchers are so focused, also focused on the functionalities. Of the system, or what this fun what this system can can do, what kind of cool function it can provide, but they should uh, uh, more focused on what the user really needs, what they really want, and what kind of problem they they want to be solved. This is user-centered 
uh, design. For example, most of the visually impaired people are old people. You have to take their physical condition into consideration and their acceptance to the new technology into consideration. I have to take them as a key factor in developing new um, technologies. Also, some more meaningful information, environmental information, uh, also needs to be provided. For example, there is a path or service in front of the user, maybe it's graded or some steps ahead that are important to them. And also the position and the nature of objects on the side of the path, for example, maybe there's a hinge of fence or doorway on the left side or on the right side, and that are both important. And so this one, I call it the bandwise. Because there is a certain uh, researchers called the visual tactile or visual auditory designs. They try to um, try to trans uh, translate the uh, visual information to the audio information. But actually, it turns out uh, the magnitude of the visual information is much, much, much larger and bigger than the audio uh, information. So by just uh, really transforming this information, you easily call it overload feedback. They cannot handle so much information from the audio feedback. And also, the next one is mobile usage is, is booming. This chart just shows the uh, percentage of users and their acceptance rate to the blue bar represents the mobile phones, and the orange represents the computer, and the, the gray one represents the internet. And it shows that uh, most of the brand people that still um, accept about the mobile phones, so they, they like to use that. So the app, the development for the um, uh, iPhone app may be uh, uh, a promising direction to follow. And also the cloud computing services and to empower this app on the mobile phone is a very uh, promising direction. Um, the next question is, what does a brand book need? Uh, I got the opportunity to do some interviews with the brand people from the factory and also from the training center. Uh, before I go, I, I tell them that I am working on design some prototype, some devices, and I list uh, a key attribute of these devices. And according to my proposed list, I think the first one is the most, uh, the first priority, first most significant to the least significance. And this is in my perspective. I ask them, uh, what do you think you need most? What do you think that you like most? And, uh, and I want them to read for for the key attributes. Do you know which one actually in their perspective is the most uh, promising or most significant one? This is my, uh, my list. I also want to ask you, what do you think they need the most? From these eight key attributes, like the past finding, uh, object detection is that helps them to know whether it's a sofa or chair. Also, detection means that, okay, there is some, some obstacle we need to avoid and uh, travel direction, and uh, to never mind this one, and the speech interface, and figure safe. Affordability means the, the money that they can able to buy. So which one that you think this is most um, significant or needed to them? Well, you said that so much of the, at least coming in the next decade, or <coughs> even now, the largest proportion of people who have visual impairments are in third world or in developing countries. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if affordability would be a little bit higher than at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, maybe the different countries that have um, different levels of, of that needs. But as far as I know, the people in the US, they do not have that issue. Okay. They, they can do that. And also the governments have some funds to support them too to buy some device. Maybe, maybe you have your, your own answer, but uh, according to the feedback from them, they rank the speech interface is uh, mm -hmm. most important to them. And also they add the face recognition as the second, and maybe it's important to them. Not only object detection, they want face recognition. They, they tell me that, that if somebody is working according to them, they want to know who they are. They want to know whether this is Jesse or this is Smith or somebody else. They want to say, hey, hi, how are you doing today? Something very simple operation in our life maybe become very significant to them. 
and uh, I asked them why you think fish interface is important. They said everybody wants a talking head, and and I then I realized that not only the navigational function is important, but also the social life is important. They are so desperately want to um, communicate with the outside world. They want to get involved. They want to know more about what's happening around them. They want to know, want to have conversations with not only a device but also other people. Want to get more semantic, meaningful information from the outside world. So that's what I get from their feedback. But for the other country attributes, let's say, okay, never mind. They do not care about the others. So if I if combine them together from the researchers and the customer users' perspective, and list some. Um, hints for to answer this question: How to conduct effective research for the blind people in the next decades? First, I, I list here is that you, we have to design some human-centered design by considering their social factors. Second is to de uh, develop some comfortable human-computer interface for specific users, especially for the older people, for to take their physical condition into consideration. And also the smart, portable, mobile devices supported by powerful cloud services is a more promising direction to follow. Okay, so to make a conclusion, I have introduced the uh, previous called Go or No Go simple uh, devices, and from that to the current ongoing uh, projects, uh, we call it uh, smart or robotic, whatever these devices. And uh, I also share some experiences from these researchers and also the customer needs. Uh, maybe that give us some hints. I call this area uh, maybe the AI or whatever, something like that. But hopefully, it can build, uh, end up with some really practical devices for the blind users. Uh, in the end, I want to uh, introduce a little bit of all my my ultimate goal. I uh, working on these projects as my PhD. After that, I also uh, working at the post up here to continue that the, the same project. What I want really want is I want to uh, to see what this project will may end up with. What is the result we can come out from this project? Maybe not this year, but in the next uh, maybe five or ten years. Hopefully, can there is really um, practical, useful devices that can put into the hand of the blind people to make their life easier and colorful. And uh, what my ultimate goal from this uh, project, or what I'm doing, I think that I name it as an electronic guide dog. Because compared to the guide dog, this small device on the right hand can do not need a training fee, and uh, do not need to feed him, do not need to actual care, can easily shut down. The guide dog can never be shut down. Shut down. And also, the cost may be uh, 1500 versus $15,000 for a trained dog. And also, this device has to free one hand of the brand people. And they, they want, they already be occupied by the white hand. They want to free the other hand. They want to use that hand to do something else. And also, provide the real time outdoor, indoor GPS. Outdoor is very easy, but for the indoor, it's difficult. That is the issue what we are trying to tackle in this year. An obstacle detection. And from talk to conversation, not just a talking hand. It should have some conversation, have some AI intelligence behind uh, that uh, function that can really become not a talking machine but a friend to help them to more interact with the outside world. And some object of face detection and the same analysis is also important. And uh, for example, the guide dog can, if, if a trash can is falling down the road, the, the guide dog can help the user to avoid that trash can. But the, the the people, and that, that person really wants to know what's happening over there. So if, if the device can see that, can analyze the, if the, analyze the environment and tell the user, okay, the trash can is falling down the, on the road, that is really awesome to them. So hopefully, we can do end up something that is, can, um, how to say, to change the, their lives, to make their uh, travel more safely and independently. Okay, that's all. Thank you for your attention, and I'd uh, like to take any questions or comments. Thank you.
So how long do you think that it would take for you to take your research from what you're doing to market? Like how long does that process? Uh, in the beginning, I thought about three years, uh -huh. but now I think maybe eight years. <laughs> <laughs> the more you know, you realize there is some bottleneck technique not that easy. Mm -hmm. so in the research paper, they can have some have some claims. They have done some experiments, but sometimes in the practice scenarios, it's totally different story. You have to consider many different issues, like the bandwidth issue, mm -hmm. the the, uh, the battery issues, and also the the computer uh, power issues with this um, board, the small computer. You also have to take the, the camera issues and also the user experiences. Because when I use it, I use it cautiously. But when a brand person uses it, they just use it this way, but then the algorithm totally fails. So this is not that easy. I think maybe, I hopefully, I, I, in the coming future, I'm, I'm working on that prototype. It, this is already been done. But I'm working on to improve it. But to the point that the the um, the, the youth, uh, blind people can use that in their daily life is, I think, at least uh, uh, seven years or something like that, until there is some huge uh, improvement uh, in the technology or algorithm or something. Would, would this be something that health insurances would cover? Because like, I was thinking about your cost question earlier. At least in the United States, is it something? Do you know if? Um, like guide dogs are supplemented by health insurance. Oh, guide dogs, I know that the, you, you are a brand person wants a guide dog, they just need to uh, submit an application mm -hmm. for a guide dog, and they have to fulfill a certain criteria. And in order to show the, the institution, there's a, a guide dog training center that just uh, received the application from uh, everywhere in the, in the country, and, and that to the evaluation, you, you are satisfied. Averagely, you, it takes about four to six months and you can get a guide dog. And you do not need to pay. And okay. you do not need to pay. And they, they, they are already being funded in the department. And I wonder if, the, since this is electronic technology, this would be like, they're all maybe similar to funding for durable medical devices. Mm -hmm. Like DME is durable medical devices, durable. like the ca classification of devices that, mm -hmm. um, like a CPAP machine or something. Yeah, but I know, and I haven't been in this for a little while, but like the FDA has like a special way to evaluate electronic devices that support health, right? All these apps that are out there, whether they are um, acceptable health support devices. So I think it's complicated. Okay. Yeah, maybe they not be covered by the health insurance. Well, anything that needs to be FDA approved takes another 12 years or something. Like, um, it's worth it when it's working. Yeah. Because that's what people are going to buy. Yeah. But, um, like, with the rapid outcome of better cameras and better IAs and better learning algorithms, mm -hmm. like this is totally going to be possible. And... The iPhone on its own already has so yeah, many yeah. options. So. Yeah, and technology just changes so so fast. So we we have the hope that it can done the things, but we need to really to um, to get them together to try have many trials and to, to test whether it can work for them. And we also, I think, um, two years ago, we have contact with the FDA. They have different categories to for the test because they said it is uh, outside user do not have intrusive. Do not have to intrusive into the body of the user, so that part is um, become to the. I think this. You may have to pay the minimal cost to pass the FDA test, and uh, some vendors have already contact with us. Maybe can put into the S S F kind of industry production. My my other said uh, said that it's not mature to to that stage to be produced some way. Yeah. All right, well, thank you thank so you. much. Thank this you. Great. Thank you.